Hello. Hello. Happy Friday, everyone. We have the Wednesday stream today on Friday. And uh, this time, not so late. Um, it's lunchtime, so I think most of you probably eat while watching us. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, feel free to do so. Um, uh, but we wanted to have this uh, still this week because we had some health issues in the beginning of the week after Easter, but um, that uh, topic was quite interesting in our opinion. And I've written about that. And next week we want to do some practical stuff about that as well to really show what a platform actually as a pass solution actually is, which means um, we will show it while um, really having some form of dockerized application and how we actually bring it online. So how we use it, um, how we work with it, of course, in a nutshell, so this is nothing very complicated, very easy services we will have then, but um, it shall show why it is, um, why PASS is a good solution to focus on value. And this is about actually uh, one of the big topics for today. It's talking about value. So um, we have pointed out that this entire um, episode shall be about small teams. Well, it's part of the headline, small teams. Why small teams? First of all, what, what is a small team? Maybe um, small team is actually, for me, some form of acronym for a small company, because oftentimes the small company does have a small team, and the small team is just, a develop, let's say, several developers. At minimum, two developers, up to five developers. Those are, those are small teams. And actually, the team size I'm used to. So this is personally where I am at home. And when I work with other companies, it is the same. So it is always like this. Yeah. I would say tendency to five developers, not two. So two is actually a rarity. Um, but um, this, is, this is about it. And when you have this size, um, this company size, uh, so if this is the only team you have, or maybe you have two teams doing mm -hmm. different things, uh, but you have a company which is in the size of, I don't know, 10 to 20, maybe 30 people, depending on the domain you are in, but um, the, 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 the teams are just, let's say that the IT teams are just smaller, um, yeah, just small teams in this case. And, and this is another big aspect, most of the time, we're talking about teams consisting of software developers, which means, um, I, I really mean developers. I, I, I mean the persons who type code, right? Um, doing the IDE stuff, um, creating features, working on tickets. Um, not so much the people who are actually doing infrastructure all day long. So when I see that and when I walk over conferences, cloud conferences, uh, or larger companies, or when we talk about the, the topic of platform engineering, we have mm -hmm. oftentimes professional ops personnel. Um, that can be cloud ops persons, IT ops, SIS ops, uh, AWS consultants. There is a lot. So everything regarding the stuff which happens after the development, mm -hmm. or what we just refer in a shortcut to ops, right? So um, how we operate an, um, um, a software actually in production. And this is, uh, this is one of those aspects. In smaller companies, you don't tend to have those because you have so tight limitation and constraints that you need to focus on value. The creation mm -hmm. of value is existential for you. And you can't just say, okay, I need two more people. Let's 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 take a look. You need to have good reasons. Uh, you need to have the limit. You need to have the budget for this, and uh, stakeholders, business owners, whoever owns the company or owns the shares on the company, wants to ex um, know exactly why you want to hire. So why do you need a plus headcount in this case? <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry. Um, Especially when it comes to crea the creation of value, and we're taking about, uh, well, we're thinking about ops. We qu and we quickly come to this um, to the conclusion that ops is actually a cost center. So when we take a look at the at the business topology and take a look at the controlling of the company, then ops doesn't really create money by itself. So you can save some money, but this is not really the creation of money. This is just an optimization to not spend that much. And um, this is um, actually something very important to understand. So when we um, when we want to reduce costs um, in the ops, we need to have something um, which doesn't hinder 
our developers to create value because there is actually the profit center where we create value features something the users enjoy something which can be you know sold to someone and creates value in in some form and actually cost is not the case so you need to make sure that you keep costs down while not um, getting into the way of the developers which means you can't just remove it because then you don't have a solution anymore and if you make it too complicated for example um, you you create some very complicated aws infrastructure environment and then you leave it to the developers to work with you actually hinder them because most developers i know don't really know how to handle this themselves it is a little bit like trial and error and most of the times those architectures are not very well made or very well made setup and even if you have you know, even if it was set up by another person, another company, it's a problem with the ownership. So the developers can't really adopt those because they never were professionals in this case. So ops and dev are definitely different professions, which um, so many people, especially seniors, do have ops skills. So I myself have ops skills as well. I can do ops as well, but I would never apply to an ops, uh, to a real ops position in a cloud company because I am not good enough for that. I'm good enough to do a little bit of platform engineering for my own teams. And that's it. But this is just the uh, stuff you need. And this is the reason why um, we have this topic today where we really want to talk about how to make it possible to speed up a small team or small teams in this case in small companies um, and provide them what we know from larger companies or middle mid-sized companies already which is called platform engineering where you have a dedicated team or a dedicated instance which is helping you to create a platform which you can consume in smaller companies who don't have that instance and what i want to point out today is the idea not to hire someone who's doing that for you but having someone who's providing a, a ready to use product and you adapt to this product and why i think this is actually the better case and why i think others who uh, do that for small companies should tend to use passes as well and more help integrate that to create value instead of just provide something um, which others can't use because this is what i unfortunately often see or saw in the last three to four years especially because i'm i was aware of that my first um my first topics back then were cloud native devops uh, aws ecs and those kind of things and um, kubernetes of course docker swarm clusters and i i saw how how people really created as so freelancers especially created environments in best practices and they were good so the environments it, they, they made sense but to use them you needed to have at least decent op skills and you know i'm talking a lot about average developer and some kind of and those kind of things and the average developer does not have those skills so you can use the the, the, the platform then but you can't modify it you can't align it to your needs and you can't really use it in a detailed level so you are always dependent on this specific person who then saves you the day so you basically implement a heroic person um, which you are you, you, you bind yourself to this person in this case because this is most of the time a freelancer and god forbid this person is not available for you anymore which happens regularly in the freelance space so be careful about that better is that because also small company you need to rely on something you have slas yourself you need to make sure that things are actually available so it does make sense and this is the the stuff which was created in the last i would say two to three years we saw a shift towards pass um very early platforms were heroku or Vercel, people know those, those platforms, but there are other platforms which are actually more going into direction of what you do. For example, the typical thing, you have AWS, you got some credits, you go to AWS, you start to, t to tinkering around with the tools there. After several weeks, you get a result which isn't great. And to have that, the idea behind it, to have an orchestration, to have networking, to have space to have managed databases all the kind of things in access manage all the kind of things you, you need to actually set up your platform to start with as a small company and um, there are products out there which cover this for developers it is 
ready to use for developers, broken down to some YAML files and uh, very easy to use, maybe sometimes even UIs or ClickOps, but you can use it. It is like the average developer is able to understand and use it. So as long as you understand th things like Docker, then this is basically the interface, the contract between those platforms is understand Docker and how you would route to Docker. This is all you need to know. So if you can start Docker Compose, you will be able to start a platform as a service solution. And this is what I appreciate a lot. And this can be scaled and this is different. So in very small companies starts often differently with past than companies who have four to five teams now scaling up. And then on some point, of course, pass is not so interesting anymore because it is too restricted and you need to go to platform engineering, which is a topic for today as well, to talk about this transition. Um, uh, this is very interesting uh, as well to know. So when is the point when you can't use PaaS anymore? This is the reason why it's, in my opinion, a solution for small companies and small teams. Okay, I've talked a lot. Dennis, what do you think? You are muted. I'm muted, yes. Um... Well, I come from a similar background, you know, I, I never really liked doing ops, but I have ops skills by necessity. And generally there was this temptation of wanting to cheat the game, right? So context, mm -hmm. startup, about Dunbar number, sized team, teams, employees, engineers, right? So somewhere between five to 13 people in, in the engineering, up to 21 to 25 people in the overall organization. And generally there's this temptation to cheat the constraints of the company, right? So they might say, oh, we want to do five things, but we only do have capacity to do three. Mm -hmm. How can we get five done, <laughs> right? Which is the wrong way of which is the wrong way around it. And I see this quite commonly in startups. We can do three things. How do we do five? Mm -hmm. uh, and then they try to, to come up with like really inefficient ways to then do two really slowly, pretending it's five. Um, and the same thing, ha and this is on product engineer. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens often on what you called ops on the ops side, right? So the, let's say the infrastructure provisioning, infrastructure mm -hmm. maintenance, infrastructure monitoring, best practices, introducing or maybe adjusting best practices and how infrastructure is being scaled, used, um, maybe some mentoring even. Mm -hmm. um, if, if usually there is somebody who really understands it and then starts sort of pushing responsibilities onto the, onto, onto the teams rather than centralizing the authority. Um, and on ops, the responsibility is, should we hire someone? Should we hire, you know, half an engineer, right? So that's yeah. 0 0.5 DevOps person who is sort of with the company, but not really. And uh, the reality is that even though you might say, oh, I can just get any AWS certified DevOps engineer. And that's not the case. Because the certification just tells you that the person is up to date with the interface. They have mm -hmm. read the documentation and they know how to use the interface. That doesn't mean that they understand your particular setup, which means that every time you change this person, the new person obviously will want to do certain things differently. And if you have never documented why you did things a certain way, then they will try to retrace that with their current level of understanding, which is usually leaning towards this aspect of, I will change many things, but I see that it's messed up. So I will focus on the important things first. Uh, and that's a very clumsy way. And th there's a cost saving strategy that ends up costing a lot, right? So it has a high, a medium, huh? How would you describe this? The infrastructure cost can be low, medium, high. Uh, generally, you say, I will ignore I will ignore infrastructure until I really need it. And then you do this path of low, 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 high, and then you mm -hmm. never get out of that. So what you do instead, people might say, oh, I will outsource it to somebody. Mm -hmm. And that is the medium path. 
but there's no guarantee that it will be medium, 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 low. In, in fact, it might actually just end up being medium, 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 high. Yeah. Uh, so the best solution is to, to say, okay, I have a cost saving strategy here. Mm -hmm. I will pay upfront. I will take the high solution immediately so that the person can start cost optimizing operations from day one. And then it's high, low, 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 low. Like that's what you're aiming for. There is no alternative that will be low, 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 low. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the that's the um, that's the La La Land option of as long as I don't hire any DevOps person full time, infrastructure will be cheap because they're the highest expense. And that is because we're we're we're, we're tempted to use averages or you know linear increases, but generally the complexity of these things, especially SaaS cost, especially Chat GPT. Um, they generally follow a power law curve with your users, uh, orthogonally with inefficiencies in your architecture, right? So your inefficiency in your architecture can be a thousand fold increase in costs, not a two fold increase in costs. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with bugs, you know, you have, you might have, I don't know, serverless functions and you might actually accidentally over provision something or be too, you know, throwing money over the wall and solving problems, solving architecture problems with money. And then you, you, you lose in this game of trying to optimize for salaries too early. And then, you know, trying to outsource or semi source or, you know, contract uh, hire somebody for half capacity. Yeah, there's, there's an example for this. So for example, um, um, so I, I'm not sure if this is an exact example, but I just want to note something. Um, so I saw that now quite often that developers who, let's say, have the hat of the DevOps person, let's call it quickly DevOps today because it's actually the wrong term. But the, let, let, let's let's call it ops person. Let's don't call it. Let's call it ops person. person. DevOps ops is person. not the right. We're okay, not. Uh, we, we we are we are believers in the DevOps culture. Let's call it the platform person. The, the platform, platform person. The platform yes, person yes. is um, I'm past today, so. exactly. And um, then the, you ask the person who, who who's actually a developer and shall take care for the um, for the platform, and they mm -hmm. see a problem. For example, they are so slow, and we need to scale, and scaling doesn't really work. And then mm -hmm. this person does spend a lot of time on scaling the infrastructure somehow, in some way, mm -hmm. testing a little bit, don't really knowing what, what, so no experience in those things, but still doing because it's a necessity because we need to get this performance, right? So users are unhappy, we got a lot of tickets to solve, but the real problem in reality is the software architecture, as you just said. There is maybe some over complex uh, queries. We have maybe some uh, using GraphQL with two complex resolvers, and we don't see that. We don't focus on that. So instead of really tackling the problem where it is or rooted, mm -hmm. which is in this case the development area where developers should take a look for those errors, we tend to try to throw ops or let's say CPU power, compute power or RAM at this problem. And we try to instead uh, so figure out how we can do this while we are not su sufficient enough to actually do this instead of focusing on the real problems. And this is where I think PaaS does help us because PaaS is a little bit like when I talked about Tailwind. It is a little bit, it does have an upper ceiling of complexity. You can't do anything with pass you just want to do. Pass is delivered, so a real pass solution. I'm not talking about infrastructure as a service. This is this, the stuff with the I in the end. I'm talking about the P, so it is a ready-to-use platform, something where you don't need to set up the infrastructure in any way. You just order it in form of a UI or a text file, a YAML file, something like that, and you get it right? Mm -hmm. Including routing, including everything. And this is what I'm talking about pass in this case. But if you are tempted, tempted to, to go into the I, um, into the infrastructure as a service area, then you need to assemble everything yourself. And mm -hmm. the complexity there is, I would say it is, it is even as as complex as you would do it in a traditional way to set up service yourself. It is complicated to do that in the right way. And AWS certificates, I never saw that they actually help you to do that. So you need to you need to find out how it actually works. And I know so many people working as ops or platform persons in, as in freelance. Um, I, I know one very well, actually. I know all the stories where they're sitting in the evening and try to solve 
strange terraform provider problems and you really it is like no that there are those things which are not documented and you sit there and try to solve them as a professional ops person as a non-professional ops person you actually fail doing that oh, and you you waste so much time you're an expensive person as a developer mm -hmm. um, and you should create values you, you need to focus on the creation of value not ops ops is not your concern and Actually, ops shouldn't be a big of a concern for any small company, because well, ops. I, I, would, I wouldn't say that. You know, uh, you know. Uh, I would because. Um, uh, yes, but you, you have you a very should... specific context. You have a very specific context. Like you have primarily worked in bootstrap companies, um, so you would cost optimize very early, right? So, uh, in contrast, if you were a seed funded startup from, uh... a, from an American seed fund, let's say. Uh, it's very likely that you wouldn't you wouldn't do ops manually. You would actually solve the majority of the problems with the credits that you were given by your VC fund. Yeah, yeah, and, but 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 that's but that's not but, the same thing. That's not the same thing. When you say you shouldn't be doing ops, you should be delivering value. It's possible that a team okay. that does a lot of ops for free. That is I, not disagree. The same thing. That I disagree. I disagree. I dis I totally <laughs> disagree because it ends up in the same problem. And this is the point. So I, I there, there are, you know, uh, seed funded. So you, you, you don't really start as a very small company uh, when you are a seed fund and you have a headcount of 20 developers, then we, we're going in the direction of mid, mid sized companies already because it, we're talking only about the, the engineering team right now. And um, startup, yes, but you know, and, and the, the, corporations, the, mid-sized starts at about and, and, people, and, and the so point is, um, exactly you need around. a good reason. You need a good reason for high complexity. You need a good reason. And I don't, I don't discuss here. You need a good reason for high complexity. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do that, if you just accept because you got credits from AWS, I know companies which got over a good five-figure sum of credits, and they say, oh, yeah, we just used that. But what, what do you actually got? EKS, ECS. Those are the two options yeah. you can get. Arguments. And both, both options are not great for just developers. So you, if you get those credits, is the rest of your company capable of using them? And if the credits are done, what are you going to do to the next cloud provider who's giving it. you the next credits? That's so it. no, no, you, you, need, you need to make sure that this, this infrastructure you set up there will will be, let's say, usable and maintainable, so the qualities are important, um, over a longer period of time. And if you can afford to have a platform engineering very early on, then we are already not in the context I have discussed in the beginning anymore, where I, where I differentiated between those two points. But if we, are, if we don't have that, and even seed funded companies oftentimes don't have that because they focus on the creation of values. They are very prototype heavy. Um, then you need to make, then you can do the very same with good passes um, for those companies. So as long as you stay agnostic, and this is, this is an important thing. So serverless is a platform as a service solution as well. I let's personally don't like it. Let's not go into that before we go through chats. We have three very okay. good questions waiting. Good, good. Ah uh, yeah, shall we shall we go with? Right. Sure. Right. Let's do it. Uh, an ops person just tried to call me. Um, <laughs> it's actually I need to. They can uh, come on stream and join us. <laughs> <laughs> we ha I, I had him already on um, uh, on a uh, podcast. Um, so, Kaloyan, what I was describing is partly the situation I'm currently in. With the looming change in my employment status, I'm hanging um, and I'm handing over infrastructure and platform duties. Yeah, Kaloyan, as far as I know, you are a senior developer, um, which is then the situation we just described. And you are responsible for something where others, let's say, uh, ops person should be responsible for. And... If you can't handle this responsibility, it does make sense to handle this responsibly over to someone else. I released a video today where I in the beginning say you need to outsource this, but you should not outsource it to an individual person, which yeah. means you can outsource it if you have a team and another team inside your company. This form of team 
outsourcing is okay in this case. This is the platform engineering team then. Yes. But don't do that to an external single person because you're a small company. You cannot afford a full-time person. So you just mm -hmm. hire for several hours a person who is creating for you a fully fledged yes. setup don't, and you can't manage it anymore. Don't staff augment, right? So you require a service and you need to create that service inside the company, ideally, right? So, you know, if you're a big corporation, you wouldn't outsource your accounting to an individual. You would want to hire an accounting mm -hmm. firm that manages the entire service capability that you can, and then it gets more and more expensive the more complex it gets, up until the point where you bring it in-house. And any, any company, any business owner will tell you, you want to get you either want to keep your accounting simple so you can keep it outsourced mm -hmm. or you want to bring it in-house as soon as possible to start optimizing as soon as possible. Not to do cost cutting, but to actually have your accountant, your CFO then essentially be an active participant in your strategy so that you can find ways to optimize your strategy so that you make your operations more, more, uh, more, more compliant, more tax optimized, um, and they might actually actively seek out opportunities to you to create more revenue by, I don't know, um, optimizing ho how you're holding your assets, optimizing maybe what government grants or what government programs you're signing up for, how you hire, where you hire. You know, um, um, in the US two years ago, they signed very much under the table this bill that extended the amortization cost uh, outside US um, service workers like software engineers, um, which sort of preloaded a lot of their tax expenses into the active year, which means that hiring outside of the US, anybody from the EU became extremely more expensive, which is also why you're seeing the, the situation in the, in the in the hiring market that, you know, not a lot of US companies now, startups especially don't want to hire overseas because of the tax implications that didn't exist two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but to reiterate, when you said earlier not to do ops, um, I would like to differentiate that you don't want to be stuck in a maintenance loop. You want to mm -hmm. actively create a platform that serves your needs yeah. so that you don't have to constantly maintain it, so that you don't have to fight fires constantly. Mm -hmm. right. it, uh, it should would just it should just work for you for your developers yeah. as expected so it is a, the sla idea behind that so which is important to have something which is actually um let's say a form of standard which means that it does make sense that you as a small team do, mm -hmm. don't try to uh, find someone who can do the workflow how you invented for yourself and uh, try to you know express that into some form of ops right yeah my coaching clients constantly ask me you know dennis do you know someone can you outsource this and i always tell them whoever i recommend i would also recommend that you hire mm -hmm. them for long term it doesn't make sense to solve you know one i, I need a terraform config can you do you know someone who can write one for me because whatever they will produce will just end up being mismanaged and it's that it's that continuous stuck and that loop of being mismanaged is what you want to avoid. So uh, Terraform itself is already a point where you should be like, that's actually ops. So because Terraform is not just a language, for Terraform, you need to understand the providers it's and how. They, yeah, it's stateful. So it, it, you also need to understand the currency. This is nothing for a developer, in my opinion, especially not yeah. in small teams. You yeah. will run into problems you don't want to have. Um, and this is not pass. So if it is good if a pass does have Terraform to be able to scale later on, but it's not for the beginning. You need something more simple, like a Docker Compose uh, file in this case. Vladimir um, has a question that relates to this. So if we can show his his question oh, first. Okay. Um, examples for good pass are uh, are some better for certain domains or languages. Um, so. What kind of passes do we actually have? So um, let's let's quickly take a look. So um, I think the most known pass solution is Heroku um, because it's one of the oldest. Uh, we have Vercel, which is, for example, if you have just a jam stack in Next.js, for example, which is based on React, Vercel is a very good place to go. 
But if you start to want to have a backend, for example, where you have another back, another technology and it's Dockerized and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff, and you need databases and a decent routing, maybe you need a WAF firewall or something like that, yep. then Vercel is not 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 really good anymore. But if if you need a Jamstack and you want to have Edge functionality, it's great, mm -hmm. right? So you need to find the right path, of course, for for your solution. Um, what I prefer personally is to have something, um, for example, what, what we use for years now is the Digital Ocean Air Platform, yep. um, because it is a form of an agnostic. So we had this, we had the um, session about cloud native um, and the agnosticism um, there as well, and it's actually following this. So you have. Are we, doc are we having a Digital Ocean guest? You mentioned some while ago that we're. Thinking. Yeah, we can invite someone. It's no problem. We can. We could do this on some point. I because want to have. You yeah. mentioned you would like to demo how your, even the higher level of detail demo what we already did yeah. for digital ocean. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. This this demo stuff we're doing next week. So I I do this demo next week. Okay. So okay, this is this is this is then the topic. But um, let's say the, we had this agnosticism where we want to have uh, containers on some point. Uh, for context, for those who you mentioned yeah. Jamstack quite recently, mm -hmm. could you just quickly explain what Jamstack means? Yeah, Jamstack is a specific. I would call it architecture, maybe. So it is. Um, you have like a headless. A it headless is primarily. Platform. It is primarily primarily based on your front end. And you have some form of backend which is totally aligned in form, mm -hmm. oftentimes in form of functions, sometimes yep. with Docker containers. Um, or, uh, for example, the simplest thing which is very known is a Next.js app. So if you yeah. start a Next.js app, you have your front end and you have your server side with some express functions, um, which but, can but be if you. All hosted. Like, I think that's important. Like, you're consuming public APIs, right? So the. And what do you mean by that? Well, Percel, for example, is specialized in serving you edge related data, but not co hosted data. Right? So the backend is not co hosted with, in, with the entity that hosts the Jamstack. So the yeah, way yeah. I understand Jamstack is that it is not, I said headless earlier, um, it's bodiless, right? It's just the head. Right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it so is... Gitbook, for example, is a head a good example. Right, so it is it is a website that lives in the cloud only, mm -hmm. and you you are generating a static deployable onto the. Stack. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so, so it is. So, um, for example, Gitbook, um, if... GitHub I/O, um, right? So generally, websites that have an active component, mm -hmm. but they, but they do not have what you would consider a back end. Exactly. Right, so this is no standalone API driven backend. Yes, and um, yes. you have a you have it is basically something like a backend for front end architecture, but even more tightly coupled to each other. So it is like um, oftentimes done with function as a uh, fast uh, so no, also, uh, fast so function as a service or serverless functions. Yes, and if you, for example, are... upload your your next JS app to Vercel, then they provide the functions you had in Express as serverless functions. Mm -hmm. um, and those then are um, available uh, on edge and uh, they are tightly connected to your front end so this is a very fast uh, um, thing to create an applications which is front end driven and has back end support where especially yes. interesting when you have composable architecture where the most of the back end stuff is just you have off zero for authentication you use yes. strapi as cms uh, you use shopify as a shop system and then a gem stack is a very interesting thing uh, and right. the european one wait what's the european australian one um, view storefront, I believe, right? So it's a it's view a storefront. Yeah, it's a it's yeah, yeah, it is part it's a Jamstack yeah. on the the view. It's part of the Mac Alliance. Mac right? Alliance, so yeah. Mac Mac Alliance is one of those driving forces uh, which um, constantly talk about Jamstacks. Uh, yeah. Because they are actually a good way to start to comp um, compose as composable architecture, um, mm -hmm. but um, oftentimes and we need to uh, we need to be clear. You can do that with microservices or Docker in general as well. So it is not tightly, but it's, it means that the backend doesn't really serve the role of a backend. It's more like it is there to connect things which are already there. It is not a backend by itself. And this is, I think, a good definition. Maybe we have another definition in the in the audience. Let us know. We will show mm -hmm. the comment. Um, 
I'm, I'm not used to that kind of architecture myself because Me um, I mean, I, I love it for things like blogs, for things like documentation, books, landing yeah, actually pages. my old blog I was love, a Jamstack. Yeah, yeah, yeah my I, old love, blog was. I love Jamstack landing pages, you know, just keep it on a private git. And then every time I publish a new document, it creates a static website or a semi static website with Next.js, right? So it's server side rendered mm -hmm. and then dumped down. Okay. Um, Okay, but um, let's let's stick with the question. So, for example, if you have the traditional cloud native approach, which is strange to call it traditional, but um, you have this, uh, you have let's say you have some uh, Docker containers for your backend, you have a Docker container for your front end, or even a static web app. Uh, you have um, maybe you want to have serverless functions as well, but not as a must. Uh, maybe uh, not not maybe, but you have uh, some form of databases as a service, like Postgres, Redis. MySQL or whatever type of databases. Um, you have some form of um, S3 space in this case, please no volumes in Cloud Native. Um, this, Those kind of things you have. And um, for this, for example, the app platform is just great. Why? Because you can start as a small company there and then you can move to some larger orchestrator like a pure Kubernetes. So app platform is based on Kubernetes, but you can basically um, then go and use what you have just created there and just move it to a, a real but, Kubernetes, but I think the big, right? The big differentiation, and let me know like where you would draw the line, Adrian, you know, because Vlad is asking also domains and languages. Yeah. For me, you know, a pass for a small and medium business is a, is a practical pass mm -hmm. when it is already um, application optimized, right? So it is an application platform. It is a pl it is a platform where I'm developing and hosting a web application, a mobile application, mm -hmm. or some form of web-based API protocol. Right? It's definitely not. I'm not going to use it for extensive video streaming. Although I might. I'm not going to use it for extensive. Yeah. AI LLM training. Although yeah. I might. But that that's a bonus. Primarily, it's for web web ready application development so mm -hmm. the platform is already optimized for that so because if it isn't optimized i need to manage infrastructure again which is again what we're trying to avoid because yeah in a small business will have limited attention span and they really need to focus on what delivers value and just optimizing the infrastructure too early will not but not up completely ignoring it will also just create a whole you know endless loop of yeah, yeah but, but th th there i have something to add actually so um, i saw that very often that um, people said oh we need to go to aws why uh, not because of credits this time because they have a good streaming service um and they said yeah okay then let's build the entire video, app video, video and, streaming. And, and there we have the problem so um the video stream you is mean, just an api you can use everywhere so yes, um yeah. use a pass if you are a small company use a pass to so start with a pass on. And then on. just, you know, uh, yeah. exactly. And, and just uh, just consume this media service from AWS then. That yes. does makes way more sense yeah. because um, you you basically run into a trap because, okay, sometimes you get then credits and you say, ah, great, then it's, we can do that. It's uh, under lock in. And uh, no, because never the is happier because it's one invoice instead of two invoices, right? I mean, that's where it's coming from, but it's just annoying, right? Just host a Jamstack on Heroku or DigitalOcean and then consume the really big, big guns from AWS if you really need to. Um, there we have Frag Thomas who says, um, uh, never use Amazon AWS uh, for your project if you have no clue about that. That's yeah, don't totally use, right. Yeah, please don't use the free tier on AWS. For a, a AWS for a, is not made for small businesses. It was yeah, never, it, never, the never the purpose. Tier, the free <laughs> tier is meant for you to try the service it is not a freemium style service the free yeah. tier is so you build something and you have one year to delete it that's the point of the free tier it's never meant to be this oh if i keep it under this it remains free <laughs> like that's not how it's gonna fly because the moment you need to make a backup you need to make security provisions you need to check logs the costs pile up Mm -hmm. And if you were thinking about this as, oh, I can do anything I want here because it's free, it's very likely you never optimized it and then you just get stuck in this maintenance loop. The free tier is only for you to run experiments that have an extremely short time horizon and you will delete that container permanently. Mm -hmm. It is not meant as a freemium hook. That's what they want you to think and it's just going to make you stuck. In the same vein managed enterprise hosted solutions like 
Atlas from MongoDB, same problem. It's already not a very good solution. It, it now has the same problem as Redis is having right now, which is exactly the same problem we saw with Elasticsearch when it changed licenses, MongoDB changed licenses. Now, a few weeks ago, Redis changed licenses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, MongoDB spends a fortune on marketing and it takes in very little revenue. It's very, as a business, it's very inefficient. And it, it survives by just dumping MongoDB on everything for large corporations and then racking up millions of dollars of monthly costs for a few big whale clients. The, the point is you don't need, you don't need that kind of, you, you don't need Atlas just because you have a MongoDB instance. You can have MongoDB somewhere else. You can have a different NO SQL server somewhere else. Atlas is great when you're using it for the purpose it was created for, to give you a sort of Power BI equivalent for analytics that is sort of outside of your operational um, hotspots, right? So you have a sort of cold instance where you can do analytics rather yeah. than, so you have an OLAP data, an OLAP replica of your OLTP database, right? So that's the, that, that's, the intent there, but it's don't, don't run any full OLTP stuff on Atlas because obviously it's expensive because of the business intelligence aspect. If you then combine expensive for business intelligence with your operational expenses that scales, that's just going to explode in your face. Same thing with things like it's not as extreme, but perhaps, um, Percona and Aurora on AWS, yep. similar, similar thought patterns. You might be tempted to, oh, this is just a large star shaped data model. I will throw everything in Aurora. I will throw everything in Fink. I will throw everything in Snowflake. And then start, becomes, start decent, start decent. So yeah. set up yourself some boundaries and requirements and make sure that, that they're actually then fit for the next two or three years. You can always make a data migration into another form of database. This is no problem. So this is way less of a problem than taking the wrong approach and wasting constantly time and money in an infrastructure you don't need. And it will basically overburden your developers because you don't have yeah. ops persons and even if you manage to have a half of a full-time person who's theoretically ops person you need to have at least two persons to have a re reliable service inside your or let's say platform service inside your own company which is actually because they are just a cost center not likely to have in your first 10 employees in the IT department so if you if you if you're going and this is the case for both for traditional and for um, for startups you always try to be um, yeah, to, to, to create revenue. This is what you try. So you will not focus on, um, you know, putting in place some people who just cost money for the first, if you don't need that. We have done that, or everyone have, has done that in the past because there were no past solutions. You needed to do some. If you wanted to do cloud native, uh, you could use those magic clouds, how they sometimes called as well. So like Heroku or something like that, where you upload or you connect a a GitHub repository and suddenly everything is running. Um, this is very good for a very particular thing, but only for those. So you need to have something in between this complex infrastructure as a service that's world. More, that's a typical Jamstack. Like that's what you Yeah, that, that, that's work. But as soon as you have a real back end, if you have a dedicated front end, if you maybe have multiple front ends, like an app or a web or app. Tenancy or based systems or B2B SaaS or and security is a concern exactly. or you have where you need to have multiple databases, uh, where you need to have a complex routing, web logging, application firewalls, all those kind yes, of things. B2B, there are B2C separation. Yeah. Exactly, especially when you need to take care of the API gateway. So not to forget, we have a security aspect as well. A Jamstack is, must be very simple in order to stay secure. Yep. But on yep. some point, you need to have security. It has to be stateless. It has exactly. to be stateless. Yeah. And you I mean, need the, the big the big aspect, I think, with modern pass solutions is that they need to help you out of scale to some degree, right? So. If mm -hmm. you have a good pass solution and it has no auto scaling, then you've, you haven't really solved the problem. Um, it, it's very difficult to say I have a pass solution, but scaling happens manually, mm -hmm. it, especially if scaling down happens manually. 
because then you'll just constantly be on the upper end of the cost curve. Um, and then, you know, the cost optimizations always need to be an active project they have to put on the calendar, you know, at the cost of attention to something else. So it, it's really, I think one of the key, mm -hmm. one of the key properties of a past solution is easy auto scaling. Um, and I wouldn't call AWS is scaling easy because they do <laughs> model the waters in, in what the credits do and how you're scaling and when you're scaling up and when you're scaling down and with serverless, what hot is and what cold is and in how many availability zones you're scaling. It's, it's non-trivial, which is why they have the certifications, right? So, I mean, it, it is complex, it is powerful, um, but it is also vastly unnecessary for most businesses. I mean, it's extremely useful for a hyper growth unicorn startup, which doesn't apply to the vast majority of people. Yeah. Um, a big startup that recently blew up uh, is in Slovenia, we have this. So we, we had a, a, a content creator that created tutoring for math mm -hmm. and they, they created a experiment where they created an AI, a chat GPT driven, um, uh, chat GPT driven sort of helper. So rather than it's a Khan Academy, right? But rather than mm -hmm. looking at his videos, you just ask, ask the, the, the AI in Slovenian in local language, mm -hmm. uh, a question about the math problem. And it, it's specifically built in such a way that it is very difficult to prompt it to give you the answer. It will tell you how to get the answer yourself, right? So it, and, and also, ChatGPT is not very good at math, right? So that's also a bonus, right? So it, it might not actually give you the correct answer without hallucinating. Um, and then he said the videos are always for free forever, but the AI solution has a monthly subscription, and they have they have extended that now to a general AI solution to the Matura, right? So that's mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, that's the general um, sort of end of school, end of middle school, um, grammar school, whatever you call it, gymnasium, uh, that big exam at the um, just before you go to university. Um, I don't know. It's college equivalent, but not really. Um, so they've extended that in local language and now they're scaling and within six months, I believe, extremely quickly scaled now are targeting every market. Right, so every country, Croatia, and then going, 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 and then just leaping, making leaps. Okay, who has a similar school system? Who has similar exams? Uh, ChatGPT already translates using Google Translate, right? So it it connects the sort of language barrier aspect of it, and you can just feed it the questions which are already public, right? So it's all public domain knowledge, but it just creates a, a, an AI that helps you have a conversation. And from what I understand, they are mostly cloud driven, right? So they would that kind of startup benefits from having a quick pass that they can access chat gpt they can access cloud infrastructure they can wire up the important functionality and then they can just gradually scale it without having to lose their minds over oh okay i need to buy a server room somewhere in zagreb to be able to you know be a little bit closer to my creation customers so that's what you want you want auto scaling or maybe regional availability or maybe you want to you want to easily move data from one data center to the other or from one region to the other whatever you know mm -hmm. aws obfuscates physicality to some degree but it does say hey you're here right you're sort of in this general area um or you're very specific and you say okay it has to be in this data center um so that, that auto scaling and sort of geographical properties i think are an important function and you can get that to the extreme with serverless or edge function based Jamstacks like Vercel and equivalent. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind because that's the, that's the one thing you really don't want to manage manually by hand because mm -hmm. it scales. Because if you say we need to target everybody in Europe, you know, in the US, it's easy to say general East Coast, West Coast. But in Europe, if you don't have to set up operations in every single country, that is the slow buildup of a typical large corporation. You know, imagine Aldi, Lidl, right? So they would have to go from city to city, to country to country, to train station, to dock, to port, so that 
you can physically connect and you leapfrog to every city and it takes decades to physically create offices in all locations. Yeah, and but this smaller, is a, except, yeah. And a smaller organization cannot, because it's possible you're creating an e-commerce solution where you are targeting that audience without the physical presence. So you're doing exactly the same strategy, but with only 15 people operating from a single office or maybe even just a remote, remote setup. So you're doing the work of what would traditionally be hundreds or even thousands of people with mm -hmm. a team of 15. So it's really important that whatever has to scale infrastructure wise is provided to you by the past service. That that's I think the one of the key ingredients that you need to you need to be looking for. We if can't I do hundred x scale. Would I be able to do that without having to you know spend two years on certifications? Yeah. So what we could do in the second half of the uh, stream session is I could write the things down on the drawboard. And okay. really, really, um, because we have the theoretical part this week, next week we'll go into the practical part to actually apply that to an application and show um, then maybe what actually happens there. But maybe to together some basic requirements and tool sets or things we need to have in a past solution for a small company. Okay. Connected with Vladi's question, we can also possibly list list um, passes, pass solutions that we've used or that we could recommend. Yeah, yeah. so if, if someone have to set, um, to recommend, I have two to recommend actually. So one one is a real pass solution and the other is a pass solution you can do for yourself with every every, every Kubernetes. It's a, it's a, maybe we can get this person as a hot join next time to really explain what that means. This right. is actually an interesting, uh, especially in Germany, interesting because of um, the more complex uh, data privacy stuff and uh, problems with American cloud providers and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but this I can explain that next week then. So we have two more comments. Um, yeah. We have one from Frag Thomas. Uh, what strategies do you know to deploy? What deployment structure is good to not be locked in a pass provider? Um, so deployment strategies. So my, my personal and only favorite in, in small companies is the typical CICD pipeline in, um, in, in continuous delivery. And then you make a rolling update. That's it. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing more you need, in my opinion, to run a smooth company, a smooth development cycle, even with multiple apps. This is how we do it in WebPAR. And what you need is you need to have maybe only trunk, if it actually necessary, do it in two um uh, in, in two branches and make sure both branches are totally integrated and deployed every time you push towards them so very easy you push build test deploy rolling update this is actually what what, what i think is the best strategy to use uh, nothing in between nothing complicated don't manage the artifacts yourself nothing so pass should manage all this for mm -hmm. you you can extend this i will explain it in the second half you can extend this for example, with things like GitHub Actions, other providers uh, who who have, for example, the CI/CD pipeline pass solution for you, mm -hmm. and you combine two passes, it's okay as well. But it's quite powerful as well. Bitbucket exactly. Has a similar ability. Exactly. But I, what I wouldn't recommend is do something something like a pass and then manual CI/CD like Jenkins or manually or Team City. Yeah. Nah, don't do that. This is like why you don't need that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, good. Did we have another question from um, Thomas One? Um, Thomas. It's just his LinkedIn instead of his YouTube because we didn't answer him, so he changed the platform. <laughs> I can't remember that. So okay, uh, five people in a group uh, is a good number. Uh, this was in the beginning. What are the roles um, in these groups? Do you think what specialization should be separated so each team member have this specialization? The question. Um, to this will uh, answer the uh, will this answer will follow sorry um i i would little rephrase it so in, in a development team people should develop so it is um this is this is the reason why we have this stream of course ops is a matter so you can't ignore it but you need to reduce it down to a fact that it just doesn't hinder you because there mm -hmm. is no value hidden you can spend a lot of time in ops and you will still make the same money because ops is just it's, it's a little bit like this we just we, we often joke about this so if you if you do op uh, if you do front-end development well then people will say oh this looks good ah this is great 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 right if a back-end developer does something no one actually realizes that and an ops person will never get a thank you it is 
just he will, this person will only be blamed if the app is not running or the infrastructure is broken. But if the infrastructure is running, this is just people expect that to happen. Mm -hmm. So there is no extra money to make this more reliable, more secure, at least in the beginning. In larger companies, there is more emphasis and more understanding for this. This Absolutely. is a different story. But in small companies, it is very hard to explain. Um, and then you say, ah, but we need to have this and orchestration. Then they ask, can't you just render a V server somewhere and just, you know, upload it to yeah. the server? And then you say, nah, but we need to have CI, CD and this. Can't you just upload it via FTP as we did it in the past? It just works with WordPress, right? And, you know, this is a little bit the, the, the point. So um, you need to be able to provide value and make sure that ops is a part and the DevOps culture. So the same team can handle this mm -hmm. with the skill of the average developer and not a proficient ops person in the beginning. This is the key message of today. If you can't manage this, you will run into severe so complexity problems. I, I, would, I would also mention that, you know, the question already implies a set of assumptions, right? He asked, um, no, no. what are the roles and and what are the specializations? Well, none, right? So in a, in a small company with a small team, nobody has a very distinct role and Generally, nobody has a T-shaped specialization. You might have M-shaped or pie-shaped developers, which is the whole point. It's your pie-shaped, M-shaped developer who is very good at product engineering and knows something about ops that you want to do as much as possible product engineering. And if they can't, you want them to do platform engineering to a very high degree so they mm -hmm. can get back to product engineering. What you don't want them to do is to stop product engineering forever and become this sort of platform lead and you have never really defined what platform you want and you don't even monetize your platform by let's say selling excess capacity to another company which is usually how people how companies uh, triage or even arbitrage their cloud costs they say oh we created this it's really good we just end up not using it all the time so we will out we will make it available. We will make our access capacity available to other companies, which is how AWS came to life, which is also how services such as ChatGPT, B2B, mm -hmm. the B2B side of ChatGPT is coming to life. It's like, well, we can do X amount of compute. It's really expensive. We have some spare capacity, so we will just, you know, we will offer it as an enterprise offering for the highest bidder, um, as long as we have access capacity. Um, but you shouldn't have any specialization, like not T-shaped T -shaped specialization. T-shaped meaning they do only their T specialization and nothing else. Right? So generally, small teams, you don't want that kind of focus because it's, it's either too much of a platform focus yeah. or too much of an engineering focus. And then you get tempted to outsource everything that is not within your specialization. And that requires way too many specialists. This is the reason why, uh, especially the people who are the developers who spend several years in traditional companies who were developers um, have a lot of op skills developed over time because th there was the necessity to actually mm -hmm. doing those things, especially when we had uh, Apache service, Nginx web service back then mm -hmm. and uh, horrible IIS service then you needed to do something, especially if you want to combine them, um, then you need to have some op skills as a developer. Otherwise, you won't be from compiling custom extensions. For I still have those server maintenance. I, I hate those. It's just, <laughs> or really, it's just, uh, this is much worse than everything else you can. There's see nothing worse than hosting Apache on a Linux distribution that doesn't have out of the box packages for that one custom PHP extension you need, then you end up having to <laughs> be creative. You, you have you, on Windows, you had this, this constellations where you had database servers installed on the same instance and, the, and then the, the SVN yeah. server was installed there as well. And everything yeah. was installed and was there. Pass. And that was initially the LAMP stack was meant as a pass, right? It just didn't scale well oh, because you LAMP couldn't, you well, couldn't Wow. Lamp, WAMP, MAM, right? Samp. So, and then the the what's the React <laughs> one? It had a name. It had a yeah. name, and it's not being used anymore. Um, ah, the React one. I know what you mean. Um, it, it, something it had, with M. Something with yeah, M. I don't know. 
I don't, I don't know. Um, Audience helps us, please. Wait, Mongo, Mongo, Node.js, map? I need to check. I need to check. Uh, uh, Kaluan asks, remember light TPD? No. Sadly, yes, I remember light TPD. I don't know what that is. Light TPD is... So, m maybe I don't want to, because if it's of the same age, I, I try to forget these things. I don't want to learn about those. Gem stack. It's funny, no, no, it's TPD, not stack. Light TPD I used for a few years. Mern stack. Mern, yeah, Mern. There we go. Just, yeah. This is uh, it's how silly, it is. right? But but it, but that's how it started. It was this like, here's pass in a Docker container, and it it lacked the key ingredient. It was not scalable. I I couldn't I couldn't scale the n part of Mern separately from the m part of Mern, right? Which is why it was it, it then degraded down into developer only, right? So it only makes sense on a developer's machine because they will, they will, they are the only person who will need it at minimum capacity at all times. Yeah. Um, but then for production, it then sort of split. I hate these split brains, right? Where you have this Mern stack locally, but then there's like a badly optimized pass solution in production. It's very difficult to, to actually do continuous integration in such an environment. And a lot of startups are stuck in such environments, sadly. Um, I would uh, I would say we have all uh, the comments done. I would quickly share my Stage screen. Two. Yeah, let's go. Stage two. Let's go. Um, where's the button? I opened, I opened a few cheat sheets because... Uh, Cheat sheets. Yeah, I opened a few cheat sheets. So I have a list of pass solutions. Because there's so many and they keep rebranding. So I quickly prepare something. I haven't prepared it. So we have here the blue area, which Myro, is. I was expecting Excalibur. <clears throat> maybe two, okay. but we already pay for that and so many clients use that. So. Um, <laughs> I'm used. I'm. I'm forced Myra to use that. Myra has such a terrible licensing structure. Like it's. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's. I. I. There. There will be a session in the near future about a modern software as a service in business applications, uh, in a customized area. This is what what Webba, my company, is actually doing. I want to talk about those topics as well. Um, so I quickly. Um, then let's go through the, those three parts, which is the just what comes to my mind, what we should talk about mm -hmm. are those three areas. Maybe I can reduce that a little bit um, to show it all on one screen. Um, do I actually, yeah, I share, okay. We'll, we'll be mostly in the operations column. Exactly, so um, so, so when, we, when we think of PaaS or platform engineering in general, this was the topic of Brian Finster for his uh, talk. Um, he, he, he stated that this is actually the platform Right. So your work on uh, in the entire team, that's correct. But the focus today is on the right hand side for us um, mm -hmm. going into the CICD part a little bit in the IDE part. But the IDE, um, especially in those past solutions, is not so connected and it shouldn't be that connected to that solution. But we will take a look how it works. So let's quickly gather what do we have in a in a in a in a past solution actually as ingredients. You can just tell me things or the audience can tell what I shall add and then right. we would and we just do it, right? So just uh, very uh, with there's well, no we mentioned we mentioned auto scaling, so I think we should start with that. Okay. So we have um so then if we want to start with auto scaling, okay, then I, I do that now in an, as another thing here um, as, as a requirements thing. Wait a minute, let, let's do that. Auto scale, auto scaling. Um, yeah. So we have auto scale. Why is that looking like this? No. Oh. Okay. Um, then what, what do we have? What else do we have? We have CDN. Mm -hmm. We have routing. Club, club storage, possibly. Yeah, we have managed DBs. Yeah, yeah. We have observability. Orchestrator. You mean monitoring? Uh, I'm thinking more observability. I'm Explain more. So monitoring would be application 
inside the application i am thinking about it more generally like inside the application but also outside the application how much does it cost how, how often does okay. scaling get triggered is it right so not as application specific but just the observability of this platform um alerting um we need alerts yeah Carmen need... mentions load balancing definitely an important ingredient okay what else let me think ssl domain possibly yeah yeah dns in general dns in general yeah internal like if it's um and, and possibly some level of private networks um right so you i disagree to... i disagree for a small team pass for a small team pass no you won't have a totally not required you, you not want to have a this is a different app this is a different app you, uh, if you uh, this a pass should not force you to think about separating your apps in the in the same network if you have done that you have okay. an architectural problem okay so no net no private network you have you only want, one network you for want network. it to be managed on a completely separate um Mm -hmm. because so network is already power. part for infrastructure as a service mm -hmm. because you need to manage this and um, so for example if you would have a docker swarm um, there you can manage your networks but you don't need to do that in a pass solution because the pass solution I mean, does that, do it for you that's the that's the benefit of the pass solution yeah okay <laughs> yeah i think Caloran mentions mail services. No, this is a, this is an yeah, external I think, I think consumable service. Yeah, I think that's already external. And this is one of those uh -huh. examples we had beforehand. You should not pack that into your own extra. Yeah, so this yeah. was the with the streaming service the same. This is not part of your web hosting. Yeah, it's not. It, it yeah. has to be fundamental to the to the. You know, it, it. You shouldn't have. You shouldn't have conveniences for the application, in, your pass service. What you should have is the um, is the necessities or the, the fundamental aspects of what does the application need in order to be operated, but not how to cost optimize the application itself. That's a business problem. You know, if you decide that you know emails are too expensive on AWS and you're using AWS. You're not gonna go off of AWS for that. But if you did use the AWS's email service and you connected it with the messaging service as well, then it's very, gonna be very difficult to get off, which is exactly what they're trying to get you. To okay, do. then then let's quickly <laughs> take this and put that into place. So um, we start at the very high level with the CDN system in operations. Mm -hmm. uh, we have then a form of routing. Um, but what's the purpose Mom. of sorting them? I, I, I'm not following. What do you mean? Like you're, you're stacking them vertically. What does, what does it? It does make more sense to stack them vertically because then, then you know how they actually work. Okay. Um, and this is the reason why I have CICD on the left hand side, but because you will see in the end how this flows from left to right and the user operations. Um, so the, the, you can even say, for example, here, this is, um, the browser or the user or browser browser facing, yeah. consumer in this case um, is coming from up here um, mm -hmm. quickly down there it's going through a CDN oftentimes you didn't snap the arrow oh, come on let's do this <laughs> so now now we have oh, no, this no, it's broken it's not oh, come on it. let's waste some time right so um, so it's just a draft man so I will I will I will have that well written in the next newsletter right so okay. <laughs> do that so we have this then we have routing so which means so to explain cdn is the stuff outside of our actual operations which um spans that and oftentimes we have inside there as well already a form of ddos protection um inside as well so um, that could be let's say combined we have SSL and domain this is mostly tightly connected in that bundle so something which takes care of SSL for example the typical um, uh, the typical um, R3 let's encrypt certificates and you can basically set this all up uh, inside your pass then you have the routing which is actually um, when you go to this domain with this path 
you go into this service and now we go to the orchestrator which is done that one um here the orchestrator does have service oh come on okay Myro isn't that good um so we have services so we could have multiple services of course so for example this or what is a service a service can be um so in the cloud native area are we think in services which means that um, you do something. So my, some people call that microservice, but they are actually not. You, not they, ca yeah. they, they can be the surfaces of a distributed monolith as well, which is mm -hmm. oftentimes the case. But um, you just have it to, to have it on a, in a separately scalable. Um, you have it that you have separate instances, maybe separately deployable things. Um, you have different services and inside there you have replicas. I will not add now function as a service, but it could be part of that as well to you have, have it. One yeah. service could be your primary Node.js application. The other service could be your primary Rust backend. And then one is next, well, the other one is something else. And they're not microservices. They're just two stacks that cover some form of fun functionality within your orchestrator and then outside facing, right? So it, Ex it doesn't Ex necessarily have to be a federated, routed, service mesh optimized microservice architecture. It can be, but it doesn't imply that. Exactly. And now uh, we have uh, below there, we have, do we have something else? I don't think so. What do we? I don't, I know, I don't think so. Those are, uh, those are the basic things you need to the store balance, physical like data. The load and balancer, you you'll need one out, possibly one outside and one inside the orchestrator. Yeah, actually the, the ingress mesh. Yeah, yeah. Um, to have load balancing here something in between and, and load balancing up there possibly there yeah okay this starts to become ugly um so and the it's, load it's ba balancing different for those of you who are not okay that. actually uh, this this is already the lb so load balancer fair, fair, yeah fair. this uh, was just named differently mm -hmm. so the orchestrator who's doing those kind of things and we have of course the um the container registry um as well so and then we have auto scaling this auto scaling is a feature of the orchestrator mm -hmm. and we have those three things which are actually i would put it now here mm -hmm. um where you have the overview of what's actually going on which means that you need to know um is um let's say i have 10 replicas here um are they constantly um, restarting do they have a ram problem are they overloaded um, mm -hmm. are they running smooth do we have peaks or something like that for this you have the monitoring um, to be alerted proactively you can set alerts for thresholds Generally and what you want to figure out is how is traffic partitioned how mm -hmm. is traffic sticky if it is sticky meaning that one user mm -hmm. always gets the same um, node and whether that is causing hotspots like so that's your general loop of observability that you'll be following is if they're mm -hmm. auto scaling, what is the distribution? Why is it distributed that way? And what can mm -hmm. we do about it? Because yeah. then, then you need you know, more logs, maybe you need different forms of partitioning, maybe you'll need application level partitioning, well, you need to send your German users to a German website, or at least they need to, by default, start somewhere else so that you are dropping hints to your architecture about how to manage yeah. traffic, locality, localization, translation or, or just, you know, physical locations connected mm -hmm. to your stuff. And, and there we come to, so this is, this is an interesting part to talk about. When we talk about pass solutions, the pass solutions often have a decent stuff on this site, but not as like you have the full Grafana or Elk stack or full integration like you would have with something like uh, data Docker or Sentry. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. So what you have is a simplified form, which you can start with. Again, mm -hmm. this is for very small start or the traditional, typical traditional company to make it easy. Because if you start to make this a complicated thing, for example, Grafana already, um, everyone who tried to install Grafana and everywhere have those sidecar containers and try to maintain that, uh, try to get some data, some dashboards, keep them. It is, it is something, it's a job of its own to do that. On a, on a you basis where dashboard, you miss key them, you lose that, the data. Exactly. And then you, how, how to actually make sure that 
Grafana itself works. Otherwise, yeah. you you have problems. You go to Grafana, take a look. Yeah. What is the problem? Then you see, oh, there's no 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 data collected for the most services since three three weeks or something like that. You don't want to have that. Or they're yeah. positioned incorrectly, and then the summation and aggregation steps take way too much load on the sidecars, and then exactly. So or this is um, so um, pass is about simplifying things down, um, which puts a lot of emphasis into creating a good architecture. But this we can discuss maybe in the end yeah. a little and, bit. So and you mentioned the L Elk stack. Yeah, the Elk stack is generally for application observability, not for platform observability, right? So. An ELK stack mm -hmm. is what you would use to say, oh, our, my, my pass is reporting high load on this area of my, entire infra, in, on my entire infrastructure. And then you would need to figure out, okay, this is an architecture problem. And then you would maybe have an ELK stack to go look into your application that you wrote, mm -hmm. the logs that you've created, to then have a conversation with your application that you're building, not with the platform, right? So it's really important that you understand does my platform provide application level logs? Does it have no logs and my application is forced to create platform logs? Do I need to understand, do my Docker containers need to understand logging and then pipe them correctly? That's always very important to understand. And the more, the more, you know, typical Docker swarm, yeah. no observability, you have to manage it yourself. Kubernetes Horrible. out of the box, you have to have sidecars, right? So the, the more the platform can just come with logging and observability out of the box for the platform itself to the degree that maybe you can print out certain logs inside your containers and you would have access to that that is a huge huge benefit because it really it really minimizes the amount of data retention you need to do on the logs never mind aggregating them and showing them in a in a, in a graphical form because then that's what you end up ha wasting a lot of time with, with hiring one or two, even three people just managing all of that, all of those logs. And then companies are tempted, small companies are tempted to say, okay, well, we hired two people to do this now. I want it on every single service. And then you manually go and do that, right? So you don't want, you, you want to create something so you don't have to do that manually, mm -hmm. right? So that's what platform engineering is. Calvin asks backups. I edit them. Okay. Um, thank you for that. That was actually a missing spot, of course. Um, so we, we're coming to, to something which is already an interesting point now. So wait a second. Now we have this thing again. So um, now 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 I'm I have my balance again. Um, good. Um, what we see here, I think it is, let's say, 90 percent, 80, 90 percent of what we need. There might be some some other things. So I mentioned, for example, um, a, a, a WAF. So a WAF solution maybe, but WAF could be uh, like inside here as well um, as a, as an API gateway container, which well, is the old. Specific. That's very that's specific. That's very specific. You could add it here. You could add it even in this area as an orange orange uh, thing in Cloudflare as an orange orange proxy, which is a little bit more complicated solution. Um, this is up to you. So how how you manage it? Most pass solutions. You can also don't... run traffic if you want in one of the you know one of your services can be traffic and then you load balance manually. Exactly. So uh, so there are many. So you can do that. So it is not. So WAF is very specific. So WAF is not really like hey i have a platform WAF. You, what you have is ddos protection of course because um this is already a, a very good thing for security to be actually safe from those kind of things and don't do that mm -hmm. in your own data center or something like that or some strange v server for nine dollars a month um that's that's actually a good thing you should have that uh, okay but um let's say this is this is a rough scope of what's going on so we have the auto scaling which was important for tennis which is indeed. So um, you need to have some form of scaling. Otherwise, it's a little bit like, why do we have an orchestrator when you don't have scaling? Um, then you need to have the observability. You need to know what's going on in a very easy way. You need to have your container registry in order to, to get this running and the orchestrator can consume from there in order to spin up new containers for the services or mm -hmm. pods in this case. 
Um, and we need to have managed databases and the managed databases needs to have backups as well. In, in, in ideal cases, you would have read only instances as well, which you can spin up, which are very important for, for let's say high loads in, in databases. So mm -hmm. if managed databases, then fully managed databases, not simple ones. Um, the same with S3, please don't use volumes anymore. It would be great to have no volumes in the cloud native space. They don't belong there. Um, S3 is the future in this case, or it is not the future, it is the present actually. Um, this is what we need to have and we need to have backups for this. Um, and this is uh, something which is not that common actually to have um, uh, for every S3 solution an integrated backup, uh, but it's actually very important to have a backup strategy. Um, what I would recommend is when we think about backups to always see the backups you have inside your past solution as the first line of defense, mm -hmm. not the main line. So the main line of defense needs to be outside of this box. Because if this box is compromised, you have a problem. And this is the point. So you need to have, I, most companies, suggestion companies still have tapes, right? So they have a second line, a backup server and tapes. And even sometimes a cloud backup somewhere else. And um, you can always have, let's think, say, two I less think, backups, never too I much. Think, <laughs> I think secondary offline backup and then tapes you know i i think i think the, <laughs> yeah yeah the, ta tapes, the tapes is the last tapes is yes. the last line of defense <laughs> yeah. this is for the people who can't sleep at night because they are afraid of their data and they they have their tapes below their pillow right like my old business partner um you can, you know, it doesn't have to be s3 you know you have s3 specifically written down at the bottom yeah it's what's important is blob storage right so you can yeah. use aws okay, s3 or the or or Google Cloud's equivalent, or DigitalOcean. Um, what right, is let's, let's call it uh, object storage. Yeah, yeah. That does make sense. I think block storage is quite opposite. This is the point. Um, uh, okay, so we have that. So what do we actually need? So so now now we have that set up. And if we take a look at this, and you want to do this here. Yeah, this part, this nice blue part in AWS yourself. Good luck, have fun. That's actually, that's awful. That's awful to do because um, then you have things like, hey, how do I do actually this, this monitoring, alerting, logging? Uh, let's, let's, let's take Datadog and try to put that I mean, the in. Worst, our, the worst <sighs> part of setting this up on AWS without experience is that there is this orthogonality where every new service you're using, you also need to learn how to monitor them. Mm -hmm. and then merge them together to a either VPC specific or account specific logging solution. And some logs will be account specific. Some logs will be VPC specific. Some logs will even be container specific or region specific. Mm -hmm. Then you need to figure out, okay, I have this cloud, na not cloud native, but like vendor native way of topology. But vendor I, specific. Uh, yeah, yeah, vendor yeah, specific. And, and, and I need to look at them sort of piecemeal, you know, I, I just need, I just want to look at my problem area first. Uh, I don't want the raw logs and AWS is notorious for not providing you like enriched high level logs. It's, it's primarily an infrastructure system, right? So it, you can turn, you can use it as a pass piecemeal, but not holistically. Mm -hmm. um, so as we said, this this part here is actually quite complicated to set up yourself. You can do that. Let, let, let's quickly go through how you would do that. For example, um, of course, in AWS, most of the stuff, if not all, you get in some form or another from them already. This is, mm -hmm. all, this is actually a good point. So regarding that, AWS is great, but you don't need that for small companies, which is the topic of today. So small companies shouldn't do that. So now imagine you would do that with no AWS and no major cloud provider, but some but but let's say a um, little bit of Heroku, a little bit of Cloudflare, a little bit of Datadog, a little bit of Docker Hub for registries, S3 from AWS, ManageDB from Mongo Atlas. Then you have a highly composed system where you get a totally different form of problem set because then you are not only uh, responsible for the integration of those parts, you, you will have you, there's this way more likely that you have more outages because a specific part, which is necessary to run the application, is more likely to fail because inside AWS, things not of, uh, don't fail that often, like they can fail if you have them spread over an entire continent. Mm 
and this is what you should take into consideration as well and one of the i would even say on the observability aspect you know because you mentioned you know continent and scaling for a easy to use small company optimized pass it's really important that there is a single dashboard that tells you how much you're spending each month yes which is notoriously difficult to aggregate on the large cloud vendors right so yeah but it is possible in past solutions i can show that next week um yeah yeah okay. no, but what i'm saying is that DigitalOcean has this uh mm -hmm. you know engine yard has this right so heroku has this and this is one of the key features if you log in and one of the first thing you just want an easy dashboard. this is observability saying, for you yes yes you just want to check you want to want to check okay why am i spending what am i spending do i have a estimation for next month you know n none of this obfuscated how many credits do i have what does a credit mean how are serverless credits scaling differently from and then i need to have credit observation what happens when i run out of credits what am i burning then <laughs> you know does it scale down does it become more expensive is mm -hmm. there a second tier of pricing that's generally all the problems you need to understand with aws so AWS doesn't tell you how much, how expensive it's going to be. It gives you a calculator and then it says, well, put your strategy into the calculator using this language and then maybe we can give you an estimate. <laughs> That's silly, <laughs> right? So the, if you're using a past solution, you want to avoid all that. You want, you want this question of how much does it cost to run our business right now to be an easy answer that doesn't require two hours of research. My camera lost focus. Okay, so I want to quickly go to the left hand side now. Mm -hmm. um, to, 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 um, I, there is a second part to the pass, in my opinion. And it's not only that. So this is, this is, of course, important, extremely important to run an application, but it's not everything. So let, ah, let's, let's take a look. <laughs> let, let's take a look what's interesting as well, which is, let's say, let, let, let's create a very simple form of, of, of uh, pipeline. We have basically the build, we have the test, and we have the, um, the artifact mm -hmm. as a result of that, the build, the, the build, uh, the deployable artifact, which is the result of a good continuous delivery approach, mm -hmm. which is a tested thing. Oh, come on now. Awful, awful, awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have this artifact there. I'm, I'm not so great at my role. Um, this artifact then, um, of course, is stored in this place, in this place here, in the um, um, in, um, probably the, the, vi the viable ones. What's it is really important, right? So the build yeah. and the test pipeline says which artifact is allowed to go into operation. That's the whole point, right? So which artifacts are production viable? Which one are production ready? Which one are green, essentially? Yeah, green, of course. So let's, don't, don't, side, we don't, we don't yeah, deploy the red ones. Yeah. Well, the, the left <laughs> side is in the red realm, right? So the left side is constantly creating reds. So you want to have a pipeline in the middle that filters out red from green. And the red ones, the developers get feedback on why is it red? How do I fix it as quickly as possible? And the right side is optimizing, OK, I have two green artifacts. How difficult is it to switch between them? How difficult is it to back up? How difficult is it to roll forward or roll backwards? Can I have cannery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why this is important. Mm -hmm. So now I try to, to, to draw something here. So we have then the deploy. And the deploy is actually the step of um, where we start to roll update in an orchestrator. Mm -hmm. um, Roll update, rolling update, yeah. Um, and th this is basically the idea. So this is basically um, a flow here. Um, so we, we basically push to the Git, Git repo. So the new push to the Git, uh, Git repo will cause a build, will cause a test, uh, will create an artifact if green, right? It will be deployed to the, um, orcus, uh, to the uh, container registry, which is mm -hmm. basically in a fully integrated CI/CD pipeline done by the pass, you don't know that it happens. Uh, sorry, you know it happens, to, but not how exactly. It's just done yeah. by it. It's a black box for you. Then when everything is green, we are in the deploy step. This is the D of the CI/CD pipeline. And then um, this is one of those points. Most passes I know, actually all, have only rolling updates. 
Um, this is, um, sorry, what you have in Docker Swarm, for example, as well. In, in Kubernetes, it's built in. You don't have uh, things like Canary. Maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, there are maybe some out there where you can it's do possible. Canary Blue Green or something like that. Anything that uses Docker Swarm or you know Docker Compose files, you can force them. You, you can, you, there are tricks, like it is possible, but unnecessary for small and medium businesses. Not. But if it's tricks, then it's not a standard. So I'm talking about yeah, standards yeah. now. Yeah, Standard is rolling update. In my opinion, it's what you need um, because rolling updates, it, especially when you think in continuous delivery, you don't make those tests really. So the basic uh, idea of CD is just to, you know, deploy it to, to, mm -hmm. to, to um, production as soon as possible. Canary implies high volume of traffics that you can statistically, that you can get a statistically relevant random sample from your high volume production traffic. And that requires a very specific set, set of requirements that I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's commonplace for all companies. Mm -hmm. I, I I only know rolling updates in the in the in the realm I'm working in, mm -hmm. and it's totally fine. So what happens is a push all through rolling updates, and it, this is then where we have actually monitoring, observability, alerting that can go wrong, right? So deployment yeah. can go wrong, health checks can go wrong, and then this is the part. And now very important to understand, this is the part where the developers needs to have full observability. Which means the developers need to see the pipeline, need to see the logs, need to understand why it failed, need to see how is, for example, in monitoring, how much um, do my my containers, you know, run in in, in form of compute? Um, are they? Is there a problem with the rolling update because all my containers are at hundred percent, so they are yeah, basically yeah. stuck? They can't rolling uh, do a rolling update. This is of course an ops problem then as well, but let's say solvable by developers yeah. and it's extendable by so if you want to add a service um, you can do that as a developer via infrastructure as code or click ops yes. depending so on what you need a strong signal that in your company this is dysfunctional is when there's a problem on the operations side the developer has to ssh to one of the managed services and figure out in what state it is or to get the logs or to restart it manually or to reload it manually or to, to delete some temporary file or log file manually or to reconnect a volume somewhere that is dysfunction right mm -hmm. that is the whole point why you're using a pass solution because the pass solution will tell you this failed here's the log or this container has run out of disk space or you're monitoring yeah. disk space usage and then it will tell you this is what takes up most of the space on this container. Um, your developer will likely be able to find out why, why that's being created. Um, but generally, you don't want to have that. I mean, secrets management is so commonplace nowadays that I don't think it's worth mentioning. Um, it is, is actually. Uh, there are there are people who don't don't. Yeah, uh, it is it's worth mentioning a secrets <laughs> manager. <laughs> But I, but I do want to mention that you can do secrets management on the IDE side, on the development side. You can do secrets management on the CI CD side, or mm -hmm. you can do secrets management on the operations side, right? So it, it really depends. From organization to organization, I see different things. Um, yeah, but uh, let, 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 do all three. Yeah, that, that's true, but we're talking about three. integrated path solutions, and there should be a secrets manager. So my point is. I don't think the secrets manager has to be part of the path solution. Why? Well, because it can be part of your CI/CD solution. Well, that, that that can be with nearly all of those things, but the idea is to have it all integrated. Fair, fair. I'm yeah. So you could have, and this is the point where you get next. So you could do this, for example, with every other um, pipeline solution like GitHub Actions or something like that and use the API of the orchestrator of the pass, which is normally available. Digital yes, Ocean yes. App Platform does have it. And we do it in, with some applications like that, that GitHub Actions is actually pushing that because we have more complex CICD pipelines where we want to have incremental builds and stuff like that and uh, more complicated testing environments and those kind of things, which is not and now we come to a downside. So pass is not like the wonderful, great jack of all trades, it's not. It is, a, as I said before, it's a decent solution. It is okay mm -hmm. 
for the small to medium size. No, it's actually for the small companies. And it, it's decent. So it does what you want, but it always builds everything. So uh, this is one of those caveats with the internal pipelines of not only DigitalOcean App Platform, other past platforms does have this as well. It's not like uh, it doesn't take a look where do I actually have changes? What do I actually need to deploy? It is all or nothing, right? And it's every time the same. But a good point, which is often the case, it is all like included in the price, which you don't need to care about that. So for example, if you have the CICD pipeline in GitHub Actions, for example, you need to care about the money because the more you do there, the more timeouts you ignore, the more money you pay. This is actually what you do there. This is not the case for platform as a service solutions. They are mostly handled differently there, mm -hmm. um, as at least in the way I know it. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so is PaaS now going like platform engineering as well into the IDE? I personally say no, the PaaS does is not really. But what we do, for example, I just would, um, would show one little thing, which is the Docker compose file. Um, and I just, I just want to mention this thing. It's all about it's all starting in, in the area we use pass with a Docker compose file, which is then transformed into a um, in, uh, into a AS oh, sorry, infrastructure as code um, file, which can be, for example, an app spec file, mm -hmm. um, which is then or YAML. Um, and the app spec, some form of application level terraforming or you know in heroku you might just have your it is a very simple form of terraform right yeah, yeah um yeah. and 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 it's application actually like level. application level right you're not you're not terraforming all layers of the network all layers of the of infrastructure you just you just defining what does the application level look like so Ex if you ever managed docker swarm manually it's very similar to that yeah, exactly. It is exactly. Yeah, it, Docker Swarm is basically a Docker Compose. It's called Docker Stack File, but um, it is nearly the same as Docker Compose File, just with some um, instances and replica settings um, for the orchestrator. And health checks. And what does it mean? That it, is it green? Is it mm -hmm. production? Is a canary? Right. So Docker Swarm is then. You know, I mentioned there's tricks. It's that config file, the sort of the app spec file that you can say. This one always gets converted, but I'll add, you know, add this to the end of the file, right? So you might mm -hmm. have a, a secretly provisioned um, telemetry instance, right? Where you have, I don't know, 10 instances running with no logs, and then one of you run one instance with telemetry, you know, which is a common solution for CDNs. You know, some CDNs you might run without logs to keep them highly performant. And then you put in one observable instance for manual debugging if you ever need to do that on production. Um, Comment okay, again, to so to, to wrap it up, wh why why have I put the Docker Compose file here? Because actually we translate the Docker Compose file into an infrastructure as code file, mm -hmm. which is then representing all this, which means that, um, of course, mm, you can do that in UI as well normally. Mm -hmm. It's not the greatest idea. It's good to learn about this, but it's not nice to manage it. So normally you have this file. It's actually not here. It's actually here. It is basically part of the Git repo. Um, and it will be um, basically applied, sometimes with a push, sometimes with an API, um, to actually form um, the infrastructure like you desire it. So this yep. is uh, this is so um, we don't tend to have that in the CI/CD pipeline because we want to disconnect those two things. Uh, but still, it must be uh, manageable by developers. This is still the requirement, and um, this is important to understand what's the difference here. So here we have development, which means the IDEs here are basically instancing the application as a Docker local Docker environment, where we have everything inside to run and start the application as it would be here. But it is not that's the same. Overly, that's overly simplistic. It's generally very different, right? On local machines. You might, no, you for might. us, not for, for no, no, no. We actually have the uh, the same things like here. Um, we have it here as well. So it is like we have the same here um, as well. So we could replicate this now. Yes, um, but on your development machine, you you are very un. Are you auto scaling? The, no, 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 oh, but yeah. uh, exactly. This is I have copied this one, okay, and okay, you have fair, actually fair. no replicas. You don't need them. Yes, you don't have um, replicas. You don't have. I mean, 
I have sometimes run integration tests that do check that um, replicas are state completely stateless. So you might run two replicas to run a smoke test to check if it actually does consume. You know, if you might if you, if you ever used a managed Kafka cluster or RabbitMQ cluster or Redis streams, you might actually want to have smoke tests for your consumer groups to check out. You know, does each team have independent consumer groups? Um, that is worth testing with an auto-scaling solution in, in in test mode. But that I would put into the CI CD pipeline, not into the dev environment. Okay. The CI CD pipeline also needs this. To spin up the test? Not all what of you them. Mean? Not all of them. But there will be some integration tests in there. And some in, whatever integration test you're running will have, I mean, GitHub Actions is incapable of running anything without you having, you know, Docker, Docker containers. Yeah, yeah, we we have a we have a staging environment against the tests. This is how we handle that. No, so for, um, for so the it's pipeline itself, I mean, right? So each step. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It is. In, in, it is. Container. It is connected to the pipeline, but it is not yeah. inside the pipeline. Inside the pipelines for us are unit tests, component tests, everything mm -hmm. we can we can do statically, and then we have integration tests asynchronously this so works part, very good for us part yeah. of your infrastructure that you should manage even if you have a pass this is now where things become you know leveraged so that you can create more value is that you should define to the orchestrator you should define to the ci cd pipeline on which images the build needs to run on which images the tests need to run on on what kind of systems do you want the tests I, I think this is the great one. thing and with with the pass solution I just showed because it's always the current the current push you do so you don't yeah. push and, 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 and here we are again in this in the realm of the small company a small business very important to understand because we tend to have the architecture of the distributed monolith that mm -hmm. you can do that because if you would have real microservices in this case um, you would it, it would be complicated let's say to do that like that because i mean mm. microservices are complicated because of issues with the service mesh right so you, you might say well i can i can deploy even, even kubernetes you know not kubernetes um helm right so helm might even run into issues where if you centralize the service registry then it's possible that you will make your node updates rolling asynchronously, but your service registry isn't. So maybe maybe when when, when you have a large swarm, um, your service registry lags every time you up every time you release. So if you release a thousand times per day, the service registry is constantly lagging. So at a certain point, that becomes a problem. Um, but, but again, this is large large infrastructure in large companies. Or small companies, if it's unnecessarily large for some reason, because auto scaling went haywire. Well, what does matter, perhaps to some degree, is how you're referencing other servers, right? So there should be a easy to follow guideline, easy to follow um, orchestration, or at least service mesh or service registry or uh, routing, internal routing, that doesn't require you to have intimate knowledge about the network. That's really mm -hmm. important, right? So either some some simplified form of DNS, some simplified form of service lookup. Um, if you have to manage subdomains of your public TLD manually, yeah. that's 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 already a problem. If you have, have to manage ports manually and do port mapping. Exactly, manually, you shouldn't do this. This yes, is very important. Everything yeah. inside here, what we just showed, so you can, so this is abstract. So this is not particularly pass, but pass solutions, good pass solutions should provide you those things. So at least the green and the blue ones. This is this should be covered by a pass you buy, not let it create not not created by a person for you. This is platform engineering. This is not what I mean. This is for larger middle class, larger companies. What I mean is this this should be off the shelf working like this for you, uh, which means on the other hand that you need to adapt a little bit that it that you make yourself work with the platform. Why you should do this trade off is simply 
Um, those past solutions follow best practices on a decent level for small companies, which means things like very basic security measurements, like we have DDoS protection, we have a good SSL management, which is built in, you can't do it HTTP only, um, you have your secrets manager built in, everything, also observability is important aspect there as well, and you have mm -hmm. most of the time Kubernetes clusters, uh, which you would need anyway, you have auto scaling, all those things, um, which you actually need to start with a prototype, go to production, start to scale, and you know, build up your application step by step up until you get to the point where you have the feeling I need to break out of those limitations. If you really have the need, and this is actually quite a long way to get there. This is not like, hey, it's six months now, I need to go. No, you can't. It is that, that that would be really unicorn in this case. So um, I don't think that this is uh, this has happened very. Um, I actually don't see that very often happen. Since you're mentioning drawbacks, we also need to mention that Fast solutions are, you know, fast solutions targeted at small to medium businesses are powerful because they simplify the mm -hmm. the orthogonality of scaling. For example, auto scaling on most simplified fast solutions is CPU auto scaling. Now, that doesn't help you if your your loading time on the user's device is not directly correlated to CPU usage on one of your mm -hmm. backend or frontend nodes, right? So if, if if that is not correlated because there's actually a physical problem somewhere in, in your network or your yeah. S3, or you're just not paying enough on your managed <laughs> database instance, it won't, the, the CPU auto scaling can't scale that aspect, right? So that's really important. And usually these past solutions have some form of CPU auto scaling or connection count auto scaling or geographical auto scaling. And that should be enough for most cases. Once that isn't enough, this becomes an architecture problem and mm -hmm. you need to be thinking about it at the platform layer. And for a platform layer, you need to move just that to a infrastructure as a service solution. Exactly. Ideally without also moving this one, while you figure out what exactly the problem is. And so then you need to have people who are really customizing that pass solution to and your only needs. That. The, exactly. the, worst thing, the worst thing is keep playing with the skateboard. <laughs> Wait, what's skateboard? That, what? <laughs> people don't know this because they, they, they never see you outside <sighs> of this frame. <laughs> Done, uh, wasn't the skateboard? <laughs> no, it wasn't the skateboard. <laughs> it wasn't the scissor. <laughs> But it's it's this. Um, wait, I lost my train of thought. Wait, yeah. So startups, especially, get they get tempted as they they see this move from pass to infrastructure as a service as an all-in move, and then they go from very low maintenance, a little bit of features, a lot of things work out of the box to overnight now everything needs to be managed manually. And then they disrupt services, they disrupt platform availability, the engineers focus, the businesses focus, and then usually this like huge feature freeze happens for six months or that this huge feature slowdown happens. And then people say, oh, that's technical debt or we grew or blah, 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 blah. So you, your main goal with PASS is to stay on it for as long as possible. And when you have infrastructure level concerns, I don't know, you're encoding videos, just move that bit to something else. Adopt a hybrid cloud approach rather than growing this orchestration and CICD pipeline and then migrating it from one cloud to the other, depending on which one has the cheapest, I don't know, chat GPT credits. That's crazy. And I see people do that because they underestimate how, how expensive chat GPT credits are. You know, if you... If you're in the ecosystem where you're on Azure and you're now getting this cheap access to ChatGPT or at least optimized access to ChatGPT, it will be crazy to move everything up there for it for an experiment, for example, because you also don't want to manage it manually. Um, the other side is uh, in the same bucket as sort of LLM, ChatGPT API usage, uh, the same applies to serverless functions. It's possible you have serverless functions that are either usage optimized 
or edge optimized, right? So they are optimized to providing low latency geographically, or they are optimized to provide low, um, um, wait, no, they're optimized to pro providing high efficiency per cost, right? So you spin them up when you need them. And as you spin them up, mm -hmm. one spin up handles thousands of requests, not just one. Right? Yeah. So you, you spin them up on a hot, on a hot region and you don't spin them up on a cold region. Um, that's very useful. Again, try to make sure that that's a targeted solution to a targeted problem that you can remove or add or expand independently of what you have in your pass if you started up with a pass. Obviously, this if you use, you know, use the blue color, if we use DigitalOcean as an example, DigitalOcean's serverless functions are not as powerful as AWS's. No, they are not. But if you need, you know, Vercel's level of edge functionality or direct access to serverless function in mm -hmm. AWS, just use that while still remaining on DigitalOcean. That would be my recommendation. Same exactly. So compos uh, composability is a quality there. Composability is a quality there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and then you just go hybrid cloud and you manage those costs separately from this one and you keep the, you try to keep it primarily on your main path and your main pass platform. Obviously, in the dashboard that tells you how much your cloud operations cost, you lose that. You have to manually add them together from two different cloud providers. But don't be tempted to now go to the more enterprise one and then just just for the dashboard, because that's what your CFO wants. <laughs> and believe me, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be an enjoyable ride to go from DigitalOcean to AWS just because you wanted all of your finances in one dashboard. But you said it must be one dashboard in the beginning. No, it must be one dashboard on your on your pass. But AWS doesn't have that dashboard. But it'll be one invoice, which which will have which, which is a form of dashboard. <laughs> 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 dashboard is that right? Uh, no. I mean, okay. So my point is one simple dashboard that tells you what's going on plus maybe an extra invoice from AWS, that is preferred over migrating everything to the most enterprise solution and then, mm -hmm. you know, making your CFO happy, but making all of your product engineers miserable. So um, I have two questions because uh, I need to be sensitive of time today. Um, we're going, uh, so first question. Um, we had it uh, as a Friday session today. Is that time of today's session actually an interesting time for you to have on Friday. So something like that, please let us know, because I just realized that we had quite a lot of people today um, on LinkedIn, which is interesting, which I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Um, uh, so let, let us know because it's Friday, actually. Um, and We're Friday is 40, 40 peak. I, I could imagine. So for the Wednesday stuff, I don't know. I've, I haven't asked Dennis about that, but I mean, uh, for, to, to move we, to Friday. We, right? We've done daylight saving shifts now. And next week, my kids are going to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So even to me, it will be helpful to. So people complained that our sessions generally meet their end of work or during work schedule, the 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. So either they're on the move or they're still at work and then guilty <laughs> finishing work with watching a stream or they just <laughs> came home and they're too tired to, to to rest, right? So it's not evening routine yet. So, but I can't, I can't have the streams later. I can only have the streams earlier. Mm -hmm. So it would be for in within working hours. For I, I would I would do it next uh, next week again because next week on Wednesday I have a speaker gig. I am in another town um, and a fellowship there. So um, I will okay. basically not, not be there. So um, I will move it I probably to the same same time Friday. Mm -hmm. Let us know in the comments if this is an interesting part. I have sent yeah. you a link. I do that for, for YouTube now as well. Wait a second. <coughs> yeah, it's actually my blog and this is the, um, the, the newest normal article there. I just a show pitch. it. The second question and let's do pitch after. That's okay, and then, um, then please uh, let us know for next week. First of all, that is interesting for you. Um, to have a live presentation and what specifically. So where are your pain points with your current stuff and what you would like to see how we solve it in the past mm -hmm. solutions we use, or in this case, in the specific past solution, I will demonstrate. 
So please let us know. Um, okay. Also, as an and perhaps as a bonus suggestion, mm -hmm. uh, since we're running into speaker season, I've been privately approached to speak or present like one of the topics that we covered on stream for some companies. Let us know if you're interested in, in us, either one of us individually or both of us together, running some form of tech talk or workshop for you at your company or at your mini conference or meetup, because we are we are doing that regularly, but we never stream that. So that is actually one of our most most active activities. I mean, most frequent activities as mentors, as fellowship trainers, as coaches. But you don't get the you don't get to see that. Uh, I just wanted to mention that if you find this topic valuable, but it's too generic, it doesn't apply to your business, and you would like it applied to your business. Um, I think both of us would be very open to talk to you directly in your in the context of your business, maybe as an introduction to discuss topics for you with you as a meetup as a workshop, let us know. I actually have a link for that. Perfect. I need Is that it on one. the quick links? No, it is actually not yet. Uh, it, I should good, announce good. it actually. It is. Um, it is uh, my speaker page. I that's, never that's, announced that's it. That's private. I see you have the hash, so it's possible you haven't published that. It one. is a secret draft link. It is not okay, published, okay. and this is my 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 problem. But yes, uh, we are open to speaker gigs, of course, um, mm -hmm. to talk about those. But I'm a shy person, so <laughs> <laughs> sometimes um, I, I was a shy person. I'm not anymore. I, I lost all my. Um, so yeah. where can people find you? What do you do? Uh, yeah, my blog, I posted it already. I think this is a good place to go to. Um, also, this uh, link is aggregating mm -hmm. everything. So um, talking about those things from the high level perspective, as you just noticed today, mm -hmm. um, I like to talk about those things of the perspective of the CTO, which is the reason why this is all called snackable CTO. Mm -hmm. I'm the CTO of WebBar. It's a German company, and we are working on SaaS products. I will talk about this in another in another, another sessions as well. How SaaS will um, be the future in the B two B area as well. Mm -hmm. And um, but my topics are actually to help other companies and other developers, other engineers to understand better how you can optimize things from top to bottom, mm -hmm. um, not so much from bottom up. So because um, often time we have a um, we have um, I don't know if it's in English the same, but um, the the fish stings from the head. I don't know. I but think yes. This is a, this is how we how we phrase it. So oftentimes um, leadership persons um, don't really understand how to optimize things, how to leverage uh, methodologies, how to grow cultures, or provide the ground that cultures can grow. And this is oftentimes the actual problem. Oftentimes, of course, not not every time, but oftentimes. And this is where I understand myself to help because I've done a lot wrong in my past. I still pay back my debt for that. And um, I, I like to help other people understanding better where they can optimize. This is the reason why we were talking today about a path solution and not infrastructure as code for, sorry, not in, in, um, infrastructure as a service for small companies. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those findings which really helped me um, and my company to become very fast in what we do um, and basically leverage the resources we actually have. And this is, um, I think, yeah. uh, very valuable. And this is what I want to talk about. Okay, uh, that's it. So how's about you, Dennis? Well, I'm, I'm working primarily with, so I'm a life coach and with a heavy engineering background. Um, with, I work primarily with uh, tech leads, engineering leads, heads of engineering, uh, PPEs, on getting their time and focus and confidence back. So I, I work with them about ensuring some form of engineering excellence with a focus on quality, focus on observability, focus on on internal processes, how to connect the, you know, you mentioned the fish, uh, how to connect the teams vertically rather than maintaining their special, specialized silos. We mentioned T-shaped specialists today. Uh, generally, there is a flow problem, a flow of productivity or flow of information. And if you've ever had a situation where you feel like you don't have enough time or nothing gets done or 
quality isn't there or you deploy and you're just stressed out of your mind because you don't know whether it works or not, those are generally symptoms of a neglected or unmanaged um, qualities, right? So there isn't a culture of excellence. There isn't a culture of quality, no craftsmanship, no engineering, very limited leadership, just management, right? So that's where I come in. I work with the leader of a team or several mm -hmm. teams generally. In startups, it's this person is usually called a CTO, which is how you and I met because we both said we work with CTOs, but it's a slightly different context. Um, and I work with them either solo, and you will find all the links in, on my LinkedIn, either solo one-on-one -on -one regularly or in completely holistically with their team as well. So I generally work with a leader and their 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 reports or their engineers if it's a direct first line manager um, to get this problem solved as quickly as possible um, with the business's interest in mind, right? So we're not, I, I hate doing TDD workshops for the sake of TDD and then not having it applied because there are business reasons that prevent you from applying good quality practices. And it's usually mm -hmm. that, that mindset shift that I help sort of bring on. And usually it also, you know, there's usually a mix of lack of confidence, burnout, some communication issues that are easily resolvable, but you're just you're just looking at it inside out and you've been stuck on this for so long that a fresh perspective is actually what's needed, not more books, more workshops, more conferences. All the more important links are on my, are on my LinkedIn. Uh, I also write the Crafting Tech Teams blog, which is where I cover the Thursday tracks of the OTJ streams. Adrian, this was great. Anything else before we sign off? No, we see us then uh, next Thursday and next Friday. This is, um, we announce it. So Thursday 4 CET, Friday 12 CET. So basically noon. Um, yeah, that's it actually. Um, no, thank you for joining us today. I hope you learned something. Um, if you want to know specifically about this topic, feel free to ask on LinkedIn, just my LinkedIn profile, or uh, go to Snackable CTO to read about the article and uh, another podcast uh, session. This session will be available as well um, in form of clips, and there will be um, the stuff we showed today. Uh, the diagram will be in the next newsletter article, uh, more in detail with explanations um, yeah, Perfect. take a look inside it. This will be an interesting one, I think. Yeah, that's okay. it. And next week we're doing the practical stuff. We're doing a little bit of pass, or so we're working yeah. with a pass to deploy some form Setting of Docker Compose file. Yeah, I love this that. That's what part. we do. Okay, good. Thank you. So Thank I would you. say I will let let's wrap it up. Yeah. Thank no, you. This we have fun. wrap it up. Um, yeah. And uh, thank you for joining me and uh, okay. enjoy lunch. Session. Enjoy your afternoon. Have a nice weekend, and we'll see you all next week thursday and friday remember we, we will keep you posted finally you can eat something oh. <laughs> ciao i wouldn't recommend to let the senior developers do the bulk work it does make sense to let this the mid-level developer do because this is what they can do best they can already perform on their own they can do nearly everything what's necessary to do in their field so let them do their stuff and you don't need that many senior developers in a team i would say if you have a team of five two senior developers is totally enough so a senior developer for me is a cornerstone or a team lead and not actually the person who's doing all the work because this doesn't help you over time to get new people because senior developers are rare, senior developers will leave on some point, your company as well, and you need to be able to get fresh blood into the ranks of being a senior someday. So in order to do that, you need to let the people work actually on real projects, the people who are not senior yet and probably become senior on one day so give them the chance to and this will motivate the people this is good for the culture there's two kinds of one thing number one there's the <laughs> there's the engineering feedback right 
Okay. I'm going to deliver this change today to find out if it breaks it. And then there's the business feedback. I'm going to deliver the smallest slice of this next feature to find out if it's valuable and deliver that and get feedback. But the, Figure out if it's safe to merge and whether it's safe to continue with these requirements. Yeah. That's all. Just because every, it passes all the tests doesn't mean that it doesn't break something in production once it finally gets to a production environment. I try to have a high level of confidence, but we're never 100% sure. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we want to get feedback as rapidly as possible on the engineering thing. People tell me there's no value in delivering anything until it's feature complete. No, 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 no. no. I know it's stable. I want to make sure we're on the right track. I don't want to invest too much money in this idea. I, I don't want to assume my idea is correct. I want to assume my idea is incorrect. It's a scientific experiment. I'm trying to invalidate the hypothesis. And we should be ecstatic when it's successful and just accept when it's not. Mm -hmm. And then how do we change course to make it to chase the value instead of just assuming that? I would like to add something to the term of confidence. I think confidence does it mean that you are 100 as you said 100 safe to deploy it's about to be confident that you can handle a situation even if something happened but yeah. you expect feedback so what you definitely get is feedback and if the feedback is a negative you can react quickly on that so this is confidence it's not about oh i'm 100 sure that nothing will happen i think this is a big misconception No, I, I agree. And, and, and people focus on the wrong thing. I want to make sure that everything is perfect before we deliver. That's the wrong thing. So most small to medium-sized companies are mostly consistent of developers, software engineers. And if you do software engineering, you should avoid to do a lot of infrastructure operations because this does not bring you any money, any value. This is just a cost factor. And if you can outsource this cost factor, it is actually a good point. Since outsourcing is nearly impossible to achieve while not being bound to those obligations than yourself, you need to instead buy something which does that for you and adapt your process to it. But, of course, this does have its limitations as well and its downsides, which means that if you have something special, it will probably mean that you need to have workarounds. I understand that. But in my own experience, I have to say that this is rarely the case. It is the same as I had in my articles with Tailwind. There is an upper ceiling of complexity. So you shouldn't just implement infrastructure operations because it's possible or someone thinks that could be a good thing in the future. 